Hi kids. Hello. Hi everyone. Uh, wasn't it great to hear that uh, Joel declared that he needs help with his parenting? He got, oh, Luke, sorry. Joel, soon. Luke. <coughs> My bad. We have a parenting afternoon tea coming up. Ideal. See you there, Luke. Um, but what a, what a great chance, actually, to get together as parents and have a look at God's Word, actually, and see that He would love us to bring up our children in the training and instruction of the Lord. So we're going to be talking a bit more about that uh, as Sunday in a few weeks' time. So please come along to carve out some space to, um, to pray for, to share, to receive some input um, about our great responsibility and privilege as parents. Fantastic. Um, we're going to do a little spotlight on playgroup, but instead today, we'll leave that for another day. I haven't talked to you guys about fish for a while, so I thought we might do that, if that's okay. Fish is our Friday afternoon program for years three to six, kids in years three to six in primary school. It's an outreach program, so it's for kids who we would love to share the gospel with. Hey, so when we think of our vision, believers to lovers, to warriors, it's the very first part, strangers to believers. Uh, we have lots of ministries like that with the children, like schools ministry, kids clubs, um, play group. Uh, I'm sure there's something else as well I'm forgetting, but also fish on a Friday afternoon. You want to see some pictures, kids, of uh, fish? So we play games uh, with kids, of course. Um, got to do that when we get kids together. We use the hall here, which is fantastic. And we have a Bible talk um, each week, and we get the leaders to be part of that and share their own application of the Bible talk, and the kids are, are very attentive. We have small groups uh, where the kids get to discuss what was just taught in the big group time, and the leaders lead them in a variety of ways, boys and girls. Um, this year, we've been having about maybe 45 children come along, a little bit less than previous years. Um, which has been a blessing in disguise because it means you can uh, chat with the kids a little bit more intimately. Mind you, they're still kids on a Friday afternoon after school all week, and so they're bouncing off the walls as well, as you can imagine. Um, hands up, guys, if you go along to fish or have been along to fish. Yep. So a few people here, but lots of children who don't get to go to church come to fish, and there's lots of children as well that go to other churches that don't have a program like this. So we encourage them to bring along their non-Christian friends as well so they can hear about Jesus. And we have a whole bunch of leaders as well who make it possible. And these guys get to grow in their ability to share their faith and uh, model what it looks like to follow Jesus. So when we pray in a little bit, guys, we're going to be praying for fish as well, okay? And mums and dads and adults, could you keep uh, the outreach program of fish in your prayers as well? That would be excellent. Um... Today, it is Variety Week, kids, okay? That's the week where we do a little bit so something different in catch. You guys get to choose out of three or four electives, okay? And we're looking at the theme of Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. We'll have a small talk about that today, and then you can choose your electives. Adults, can you remember what the theme was for Christmas last year? It was light, wasn't it? So it's a bit of a flashback. Kids, um, just for something fun to do, um, if you weren't here at the Christmas services, you wouldn't have seen this next slide that's coming up. But if you were there, you might remember we played a little bit of hide and seek, a bit of spotlight, okay? So, in fact, I forgot to mention at Fish this week, we have a, bring a, a special bring a friend week and it's spotlight. So, with that in mind, see if you can spot me in this picture. Are you ready? Where am I? to where I am. Just a bit of fun, hey. How about we pray and we'll thank God for fish and ask us, especially the kids that come to fish, to be able to bring along people who don't get to hear about Jesus and they might get to be introduced to him. And they might believe, repent, and be saved. Let's pray, kids. Heavenly Father, 
Thank you that you love children and you want them brought to you unhindered. Thank you for St. Matt's and the way that we can do that here, Lord. Um, we thank you, Father, that as parents we can come together and, and grow in our understanding of how to do this task of, of bringing up children in the uh, training and instruction of you. Um, we thank you for programs like Fish, uh, where the kids get to come along and bring their friends along to hear about Jesus. Thank you for the leaders, Lord. Uh, we thank you for their sacrifice and the way that they um, give up their Friday afternoons after a long week of school as well and serve the kids. We pray for your uh, blessing of safety on these kids as they um, have a good time. But we pray even more importantly that these kids would hear about Jesus and that they would come to know him and love him and live for him as their Lord and Saviour. And Father, for today, for, for Catch, we thank you for providing uh, some leaders to do the Variety Week. And we thank you that you are the light of the world and whoever follows you will never walk in darkness but have the light of life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good one, kids. Let's hop up and we'll go back behind the red wall. Good morning. My name is Michael Houghton and I'm here to read the, uh, the first Bible reading this morning from Job chapter 40 verse 1 to Job chapter 41 verse 6. The Lord said to Job, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's and can your voice thunder like his? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honour and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. Look at all who are proud and humble them. Crush the wicked where they stand. Bury them all in the dust together. Shroud their faces in the grave. Then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely, I spoke of things I do not, did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears have, had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 11, beginning at verse 33 and finishing at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God? That, that, that God should repay him. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. 
Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is the word of the Lord. Find he, I find it really, really intriguing um, what we heard Job say in the first reading today, um, that when he finally understands God, he says this, I know that you can do all things, no purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. He's finally understood something of God's splendor, and he's understood um, his place in God's plan it's as if he's anticipated Shakespeare who said all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players and it's as if Job has anticipated what Calvin eventually said the world is a theatre for God's splendour the world is a theatre for God's glory now Job repents in dust and ashes and that is the right response But if we read on, um, which I'd encourage you to do, um, we realise that God does not leave Job in the dirt because that is not God's plan as he reveals his glory to his people. It's actually that they would understand his fullness, that they would understand his splendour, that they would understand his glory, repent rightly and be raised up actually to reflect his mercy. And that's exactly what Job does as a bit of a picture for us of what the Lord's plans are in Jesus for his people, which includes us today as we trust in Christ. And in Romans chapter 11, 12, we kind of stand on a bit of a threshold. We're at a really pivotal point. It's a really key thing to realise because after 11 chapters of God's mercy in Christ being made clear, Paul says, okay, Here's how to respond with your lips, but also live out that praise in your life from 12.1 onwards. And it's as though we're standing at that doorway and we're asked to come in. And God has shown us ourselves in those first 11 chapters. He's shown us our broken world living in opposition to him, but he's shown us that mercy. And now here's the response. He says, join in praising me with your lips and praising me with your whole lives. Because what we want to realise this morning is this. We are in God's world. He has shown us his mercy in Christ. So we can actually live to return the praise to him. Which is what's right. But is also what's very, very good for us. Please join me. Let's pray that we might understand these things and do them. Let's pray. Father, we do ask now that you would help us by your Holy Spirit to concentrate, to be awake to understand how great your mercy to us in the Lord Jesus Christ has been and to understand, Father, that you want us to be involved in praising you, which is right and good. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The response to 11 chapters of gospel preaching is what Paul says in verses 33 to 36 of chapter 11. Um, And here's the conclusion I guess I'm about to draw um, from all of that. The mercy of God produces praise. And that's my first point, praising God's mercy. I'm actually referring to verse 1 of chapter 12 as my key verse, but we're going to backtrack a little as well. But have a look at verse 1 and why, why we want to talk about mercy and why we want to be clear about it. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... So 
God's mercy actually comes before anything that's about to be said. And it's really, really, really clear because our temptation in the Christian life is to think, I've just got to do everything. Just got to do everything. Mercy. And in view of God's mercy, then. And so we just want to refresh our our memory quickly about that mercy. And all I want you to do is flip back to verse 32 of chapter 11. And we hear this kind of bit of a summary. God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. And what he said is this, um, all people are equal. doesn't matter whether you're from a Jewish background or a non-Jewish background, wherever you were born, whatever language you grew up speaking, it doesn't matter. It's all the same because God has been operating with his Jewish people just the same as he wants to operate with all of the rest of us by a gracious promise that people who trust his word will be made righteous. So we're all equal in that. And God has come to us all, Jews and Gentiles, clothed in his gospel, if I can put it another way, wrapped in the flesh of Jesus Christ, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection. Now, it's not everything that could be known about God as we meet him in Jesus, but it's enough for us to know him. Because he reveals himself in his gracious mercy in Christ, making it possible to be united with him. And that produces praise. And I'm going to read it again. I I really liked how Millie read it. But let's read it again, verses 33 to 36. Here's the response. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. You can almost hear the voice of Job here, can't you? Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. God's wisdom and knowledge are deep and rich. God's judgments, God's paths, they are unsearchable. They are beyond tracing out. God's mind is greater than the human mind. It is beyond human thinking. God's counsel is his own. God's being is self-sustaining. He is completely independent. Mercy comes from him. It comes through him and it produces a result that goes back to him. Praise and glory saying that he is the God of the heavens and the earth and we are not. We cannot get into his mind, but what has come to us from God in Christ is more than enough for us to know him and to work out he is to be praised. And here's why it's really, really important. Here's why I'm kind of making a big deal of it um, today. And today's talk is a bit of a setup talk for what Ian is going to take us into in the, in the following chapters. But here's the reason. Praise of the great God is not, uh, okay, yeah, I get it. And praise of this God is not a grudging, oh, all right, well, if it has to work that way, maybe I'm okay with that, but I've still got questions. It's not that. What Paul is saying here in these verses from 33 to 36 is this, the right response to this gracious God who has operated in a way that no human mind could ever invent and has absolutely shown mercy to people who never deserved it the right response is a full-blown exaltation and a cut loose praising god is god and i am not he is awesome in himself my place is under him and in praise of him let me give you an example of a way that i've kind of experienced that dynamic and and people's desire to go against it Um, earlier this year we ran the mark drama here and I was the director, and I've been the director of the Mark Drama in different places and different times, and it always seems to kind of work out a bit like this. It kind of goes along. As you get the rehearsals started, the actors begin to say, well, in this scene here, we're doing it like that, but how about we do it like this? No. Now, in this particular scene here, wouldn't it be better if Jesus said, no. You know when Jesus is talking about the faith of a little child, wouldn't it be great if we actually had a little child? Because I'm the director. Everyone's just trying to work out, oh, maybe I could be the director for a moment. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. 
And this thing is absolutely not going to happen if all of you want to be the directors. I'm the director. What Paul is basically saying as he, as he praises like he does in verses 33 to 36, Lord, you are the director of the traffic. You are the God of the universe. And I must put myself under you. It is right because you alone are worthy of praise. But it's very, very good for me when I actually realize that this is true. <laughs> it's wonderful. God is the director. We are the players in the theater of his splendor to point to and emphasize and exalt his power and authority. So here's a bit of application. Did these words get stuck in your throat? So you can't say them at all. And I imagine that there are some people here for whom that is true, and that's okay, all right, if, if, if you need to admit that. But maybe you're, you're in the grudging category, like I mentioned before. You're not really convinced, but you're kind of, okay, let God be the one who chooses, maybe. Here's my word to you this morning. Don't pass go. Don't collect whatever it is these days that you're collecting, you're playing Monopoly. Go back to Romans chapter 1. And begin rereading all those 11 chapters with prayer and reflection and your questions to God and perhaps in conversation with someone else. Because you won't have the motivation to start reading and doing chapter 12, 1 and onwards. You will not have the puff. You will find yourself under a heavy burden of thinking, here's another list of things to do. And I can't do them. And I don't want to do them. And it will be worse for you because you just have not understood God's mercy and the, his prerogative actually to decide and choose over you. And I don't think it's a mistake actually that Paul writes so long, 11 chapters, to get us to this point because our forgetteries work better, better than our memories and we're so reluctant often to let God be God over us. So we have to keep hearing it again and again and again and again. So if that's you, please... Go back to Romans 1 and Romans 2 and Romans 3 and so on and so on and reading and praying and accept God's gracious mercy in Christ to his praise because Paul's saying the right response is the praise of his mercy. So there's the first thing. The right response is a verbal praise actually of God's mercy but the, the second right response is living out his mercy with obedient lives that come through transformed minds. So let's just reread the two verses there in Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. This talk today, like I said before, is just really setting the frame for what's going to come um, for, through chapters 12 to 16. So we're just kind of setting up the big ideas of how to live in praise of God. And the key concept, I think, is this. God doesn't want what we can give him. He wants the giver. I'll say it again. God does not want what we can give him. He wants the giver. He wants our total selves. And we hear it in these verses, don't we? Body and mind. The whole self set completely apart. That's holy to please God, not the self. And it's not the act, but the giver. And if, if I can just maybe use a little bit of language that we don't, don't use so much anymore. He's talking about the idea of consecration. With holiness. Complete givenness. Complete set-apartness. And he uses a really, really interesting image, doesn't he? You, me, us together to be living sacrifices. Um, I don't know what image comes to your mind when you think of sacrifice, but it's probably, it's probably not the kind of thing that we always like to think that that's what we want to be. Right? If you take it back into Old Testament kind of imagery, it's the, the animal, usually, um, the, 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 the pick of the, the herd, fattened up, prepared, set apart, killed to glorify God and actually be the blood that atoned. Um, 
do you want to be like that? Do I really want to be like that? God, through Paul, is basically saying, Here, this is where it's at now <laughs> for those who follow Christ. And it's not just a moment in time or an action that we go to do somewhere and that we leave, but it's our 24-7 living. So it's not the case that we can think anymore, I'm going to go to church on a Sunday and I'll try to be on my best behaviour and I'll hope that the kids are on their best behaviour and in that hour and a half, if we've done it well, we can tick the box, we worship and we can go away and we forget about it for the rest of the week. And for, for Jewish thinkers, it's quite particular, this imagery as well, so it's a very deep challenge to them also because the temple was the place where a sacrifice would have been made at key moments and key times and sometimes you did turn up personally to be part of that and that, that potentially might have led people to think, that's my worship. But that's all changed. It's not any place, it's not confined, confined to a time or meeting, but it's all the time. I don't know about you, but that's, that's frightening. Because as the Lord looks on me and my life and my thinking and whatever I do, wherever I am, he's asking, are you worshipping me? Or are you actually letting something else get in my place so that you're following that? So my best behaviour at church, well, that's not a bad thing. But it's not everything. It's only part of the thing. So how do we do this? Um, I really, really enjoyed that question actually on, on Tuesday night. I visited another life group. And the question quite rightly came up, okay, fair enough, we kind of get this, but how to do it? And then another person in the group answered, uh, well, I think that's what the rest of the chapters are going to be about. So I'm going to kind of offload my responsibility to Ian, and he's going to tell us about how do we do all this in the detail that is very full and rich in these following chapters. But the, the categories, I think, here are quite clear. Living sacrifice, total life, and we'll talk about the gateway of the mind to that in just a moment. But here's the question for you. Are you up for this? So, so have you understood sufficiently that what God is saying is that now you're in Christ and now you've been given this new life in Christ, that's my life? Because each of us has got to answer the question, am I up for this? And then we've got to work out if, if my answer is no and if your answer is no, we've got, to, we've got to work out why and so go back to basics and that's not a problem. But each of us, as we're going to be urged to do in just a moment, we must actually be part of this. And again, if it's a trouble and if it's a struggle, it'd be worth us starting again at Romans 1 and reading back through and praying and understanding. But without going into too much detail, I do want to tease out a couple of things that are already mentioned here, okay, knowing that the detail is going to come. So living sacrifice... Devoted to God and not to ourselves or others. And Paul says a really interesting thing. You can pursue this by not conforming to the pattern of the world. And I think we can see um, what that looks like by reversing out Romans 1. And I've just done a little bit of that. Okay, So here are the opposites of Romans 1. So what does it mean to not conform to the pattern of the world? Some of these things. Accept the plain knowledge about God, knowing that creation reveals his power and divine nature. Know God and let him be God over us. Give thanks to him. Let God be in place over nature and creatures. So don't, don't elevate those things above him. Be sexually pure and let sex be for marriage between man and woman as God has created it. Tell the truth. Don't gossip. Speak well of others. Don't slander. Be humble. Obey our parents. Know God's will and actually do it. Know Christ and let him give us life as the risen son. And so if I have to really boil it all down, I'd say something like this. Let God be over us and at the centre of our lives, not ourselves and not others. Um. I think sometimes for us, especially in our contemporary age, the challenge, one of the challenges is this, when we hear stuff like that, we think what God is on about is me obliterating my self-identity. That there is no place for me anymore, there's no place for personality anymore. I've got to wipe that out completely and just become like, almost like a formless 
robot that just does exactly what's programmed into me. And the problem with that thinking is this. We really back ourselves in that moment, but we haven't really fully understood the goodness of God and His pleasing and perfect and good will that is exceptionally good for us to do. But also, we haven't understood, I think, the sacrifice of Christ. And I, I want to just read a simple word of testimony by a guy called Zafar Masood, who survived a Pakistan International Airlines flight crash in Karachi in May 2020. And he said this, because there were only two survivors of that, um, in that incident. And he said this, This is a bonus life that I'm leading. I'm living in borrowed heaven. I have to make sure that I do all of that stuff that I'm required to do that leaves a positive impact on people in their lives. So his, his perspective had completely changed because of the way that he had been saved in a moment that uh, saw the deaths of so many other people. And he realised he was living on borrowed time, but it, for a purpose. And so instead of us thinking that God is asking us to obliterate our personalities, which he's not, but he's calling us to actually use who we are to glorify him and bless others as we live as living sacrifices so that we are actually to be walking pictures of the moral nature and righteous character of God. We are to be his evidence, which again, it freaks me out. This is God's purpose in the church, that through the church, the graciousness of God would be made known, manifest to the universe. That's you and me. And so God, when he fronts up to the court of the universe and he has to actually, he's, he's going to testify to the powers and the rulers and the principalities about his righteousness, he's going to partly point to the church and say, here's the evidence. Here's you, here's me living actually obediently under Jesus' lordship, reflecting it around the universe for all to see, living sacrifices. Wow, massive. But that changed living comes through changed thinking. Because God through Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind to conform to Christ. That's what he's talking about. So if I can use some kind of contemporary psychological language, and please do correct me afterwards, I'm sure there are plenty of you in hope better than me, the neural pathways need reprogramming. Okay? And this is what I'm talking about. Um, as an example, if we've grown up with put-downs in our families and uh, perhaps we've suffered acute trauma or other challenges, what happens is that our brains begin to be formed in certain ways. They, they track us in a direction... Um, perhaps there's, there's always a voice in our minds telling us that we're not good enough or there's always something dragging us back to the tragedy that we've experienced in the, par, in the past and they need to be re reprogrammed. Um, that's just good for people if they do find themselves in that kind of situation. But those ruts can become so deep that it's very, very problematic and they do need to be changed. When we become followers of Jesus Christ... As we trust Jesus and the Spirit is at work and the Holy Spirit actually comes into us, our identity completely changes before God. But at the same time, there's a long journey that we're now on of God changing our neural pathways so that His narrative becomes our narrative and the truth that He speaks over us because of the Lord Jesus Christ becomes the truth that we've actually got in our minds and sinks down into our hearts. So when we think about ourselves, we don't think about the put-downs that we experienced as we were growing up, and we don't think about the tragedies of the past, we keep thinking about the fact that we have been mercifully saved and now we are blessed because the blood of the Lamb covers me and I can front up to God and He sees Jesus and He doesn't see me anymore. Hallelujah. I'm free. I'm relieved. Now, we've thought a little bit about the pattern of this world and now we see the key to that changed living, becoming 24-7 for Christ, it requires changed thinking. That's the, that's the gateway. Leaving the old neural ruts behind and having them replaced. And I think it's a matter of hearing and accepting and praying God's will. And I've said it already, the letter to the Romans demonstrates that very thing. And we need to hear it again and again and again and again because our forgetteries work better than our memories. Had a cool moment on Wednesday night, just for starters, because uh, the topic on Wednesday night was all about um, hearing from God, so uh, reading the Bible. 
And there was a comment in the, in the group. It was really, really cool. Someone said, oh, I just, I just forget it. I just forget this stuff. I, I don't seem to be able to remember it. And uh, we were able to reflect on the fact that what God has done, because he knows us, he's made us, he actually wrote stuff down. Yeah, that's, that's what the Bible is. Um, and we can have that with us in multiple ways now. And because we need it. We need it. We need it. Because, like I just said a moment ago, we need to let his narrative about us, as he's spoken it over us in Christ, to become ours every single day. And we just need to be reminded. So, push-up challenge, yeah, that's a good thing. I really think it's a good thing. And I'm looking forward especially to finding out more about the issues relating to mental health. Um, but the Bible reading challenge is far more important. Because what we're hearing right now is that if we let God's truth come into our lives, it actually transforms everything and it will speak into mental health. And God, by his power in the, the spirit, has the possibility actually of transforming our minds so that we might be relieved of some of those things. So if you keep forgetting, read the book. Or let the book read to you. That's what I do these days with the Bible app. Brilliant. Wherever I'm up to, I just hit play and it reads to me. But we can't underestimate that, brothers and sisters. Here's why. What we hear in this passage is, that I think it's saying this, God's will is good. God's will is pleasing. God's will is perfect. And he's revealed that completely in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you need to keep understanding that and being reminded of that each day. Because your natural tendency is to forget or not believe it. But let him keep speaking it to you so that you can accept it and believe it and do it. But here's uh, the conclusion. It's a word of encouragement. All of this is not our default setting, and it's clear that that's the case from the text. It's not automatic as soon as we accept Christ and God's mercy, and here's why. Paul says, I urge you. Why does he have to say that if everyone just gets it? Because we don't. And then he says, I urge you to offer so why does he, he got to say that if it would be automatic to anyone who trusts Christ? Well, it's not. And Paul says, you know what, that's cool because we've just got to understand it and be real about that, asking God's help, listening to his word, but engaging our own minds and our own wills. And so over time, it's a steady walk, it's a long walk in the direction of following Jesus for transformation, but realizing that it's on the other side of heaven that we're completely transformed. So we need his help. We need his word. We need to be aware also that we're called into this together. So as we do these things, the mercy that leads to praise will be on our lips. But the mercy that leads to praise on our lips will also be evident in our lives. And like Job, we'll really understand, yeah, we, we are players in the theatre of God's splendour. And we are here, actually, for God's glory, but not only is it right, it's just so good for us, and God has made that possible in the Lord Jesus. Please join me, and let's pray, and we'll thank him for these things. Father, we're just blown away again by your goodness, that not only would you show us mercy that we didn't deserve, but that you would unite us in praise to you. That is so right, Father, because you are worthy and you deserve it. And it's so good for us because this is new life in Christ that we can live because of your mercy. Um, Father, we do pray this week that you would help us to be hearing from your word each day so that your narrative over us and the Lord Jesus would become ours more and more. And that we not only believe it, but we gladly live out a life of praise to you as living sacrifices. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. stand and sing with us. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more.
What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. All missing, all knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. How since they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood in the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy more. morning, my name's Tim and I'll lead us in prayer. So, let us pray. In the words of Psalm 65, which is a psalm of praise for our God, we are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. You crown the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. The paddocks are covered with flocks. Your valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your blessings for us. We are filled with the good things you provide for us. We thank you for the way in which you treat your creation. You water the land and you provide animals and crops. We thank you for your great love for us. All we can do is sing songs of worship and praise. Almighty God, your mercy is poured out on each of us, even though we've been disobedient, and we thank you for your generosity. We pray that in response to the provision of God's mercy, we would be living sacrifices who are holy and pleasing to you. We pray for your powerful hand over all the trouble spots across our world. In particular, we continue to pray for the government and people of Ukraine as they resist the invasion from Russia. We pray that Ukraine will continue to have the strength and resources 
to resist this unprovoked aggression by President Putin and his armed forces against their small neighbour. We thank you that Ukraine has been able, with assistance from many countries, to push back the Russian armed forces. We also pray for Ukraine's President Zelensky and Russia's President Putin. It may be that the only way to end this war is for direct talks between these two leaders. Father, we pray for the new federal government in Australia, for the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, and his ministers who will be sworn in this week. May they govern Australia with fairness and equity as we all face the many challenges in the period ahead. We pray for those who are bringing the good news of Jesus to people in other parts of our world. We especially pray for Ben and Christy and their family as they serve in quite sensitive areas in Central Asia and where there are many people arriving from Russia, those who do not agree with the war in Ukraine. We thank you for Chris and Grace ministering in Dili in uh, Timor-Leste. We especially give you thanks for the group of young people who are responding so positively to, to learning about the gospel. And we also thank you for the recent visit by Elizabeth Richards, the CMS field director, as this was a very encouraging time for Chris and Grace. We pray for Claire of Arabia as she joins the team running a significant health project. We ask for wisdom about all the decisions that are required to make this program effective. We pray for Roger and Amanda Kingdon, ministering in Newman in Western Australia. We give you thanks for the safe arrival of uh, Abigail Kingdon. And we also pray for her health as she overcomes some breathing issues. We pray for Ian and our ministry team that they'd be strengthened and encouraged and guided by you as they lead our parish. We pray for our parish council that they'll have wisdom and insight to consider carefully all the matters that come before council. And Father, we thank you for the Loggersdor dinner earlier this week in which we were able to celebrate the ministry through Loggersdor to uh, children all around the world. In our parish family, we pray for all those who are either experiencing COVID-19 or are recovering from the effects of this virus. We also pray for all those who are facing any other difficulties at the moment, whether they be spiritual, physical or psychological, and that their burdens will be eased through sharing with Jesus. We especially pray for those who are going through treatment for cancer and for those who are recovering from surgery. May they know your peace, grace and comfort. Father, we pray all these matters in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.